but if you're shooting steel um, or if you're hunting with it and your objective is the most you can get out of that cartridge like, like maximizing your long range performance yeah cutting your barrel uh, six inches shorter than it came out of the box probably not ideal What is up, everybody? I am joined by a couple modern-day gentlemen, and they both have what I would consider modern-day scout rifles on the table. Ryan, people have been asking about yours. I didn't even know Taylor was making one. Apparently, that's a thing. It is. Uh, but this is more of a tease because we're not even talking about modern-day scout rifles, no. but it's, you know, we got to address the scout rifle in the room here. I mean, it's here. It's something. It is something. Yes. You showed it to me the other day. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. The topic at hand, though, is barrel length, and does it really matter? Mm. You've been doing some experimenting. I think both you guys have. Uh, this rifle here didn't start with the length of barrel that it has now. Correct. Maybe if you add, include the suppressor. C correct. But uh, it's been shortened quite a bit. It has, in fact. You've been doing some shooting with it. Fair amount. And then Taylor, what what do you got? What do you got going on here? Pretty much the same setup. Okay. Tika cut down, sixteen inches, suppressed, one to six. Did you guys know that you were doing this like congruently, or was your like is it like one of those best friends moments where you're like, oh my god, I have one, I have one of those too? Well, Ryan dropped the idea. Oh. And then it marinated, and it marinated, and then I picked up a Tika, and one thing happened to another, and next thing you know, it was cut down to a legal length. And um, now we're here. I like the quotation marks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they they are Seems legal. so dangerous. They're, they're legal. No, they're they are. The they appropriate are. length they are. required by law. Uh, which is important. It is. Don't want to be a rule breaker. Nope. Don't. Well, you might want to be a rule breaker. But. I don't want a two-stamp gun is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. You know, it's just some added, you can do it. You can. A little hassle. Fair amount. Depending on what you're doing. Yeah. Or the rifle. Very worth it. Not but the point of this gun, though. Not, this, was, this was a hunting rifle. Yeah. So let's talk about this rifle. Sure. Ryan, what uh, what prompted this whole thing? Well, a couple couple folks that I have chatted with before from um, the European continent, uh, one of them had asked me a really compelling question some time ago is, why is it that Americans have such big rifles? Mm -hmm. And foolishly, I thought, uh, what he was referring to is the chamberings of, of those rifles. Oh, sure, right. And I'm like, well, we have these large cervids like moose and elk and caribou. He's like, no, 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 we have all of those things too. I meant like physically large rifles. And so I started talking about, well, barrel length and velocity and long-range ballistics. And um, he had mentioned to me that he will routinely hunt at the exact same yardages or, in his case, meters, that um, we do here for, you know, similar game um, with the same calibers, uh, only he, his barrels are much shorter and he, he has no ill effect. And so, you know, like five seconds of thought went into that and been like, well, yeah, I've been toting around a rifle that's obscenely too long for too long. So why not? Why not get something and trim it down and uh, exploit, you know, that handy package? I was going to say this thing... Very handy. Yeah, and now it's it's Yours only too, Taylor. it's only um, the Taylor's is probably on the button. Mine's about an inch and a half, I think, longer than the factory configuration now. Now that I have the the barrel cut and the suppressor attached, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, which is crazy or not? It's not crazy, but when I when I think about the setups that you guys have, yeah, one thing that like prevents or like a drawback of using suppressor for me even though i'd really like to use a suppressor is i just hate how long it makes the you know the rifle yeah and now you've got a a, a rifle system that's as long as it originally was yep. but you have a suppressor yeah i like that a lot it's pretty it's pretty clever uh i let out an audible chuckle uh when i pulled the trigger the first time because it was just delightful. I thought, man, have I been missing out. This whole time, I've been resistant for no reason, like a fool. Accuracy was? Uh, exceptional. It shoots 
lights out. Um, I, I put together a couple of groups with it that um, one, one of them was like the proverbial one hole, and then I kind of pulled one, and so I broke the uh, the edge, if you will, just mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, then I put down three that would have gone between about 0.5 and 0.6 MOA. Oh, dear. Yeah. So it, it shoots delightfully. Uh, you shot it uh, before. Mm-hmm. The cut yep. and and after yes uh, accuracy the same same yeah D- discernibly I mean so it was v- it was very much a new gun uh, sure prior right? to the cut yeah and it still is very much a new gun so there's it's probably some um, you know burnishing and settling that the barrel is going to do yet but the first three rounds out of the gun that I fired uh, were with 168 grain gold metal match just t- I wanted to get some rounds down the barrel and get that thing fouled up a little bit and they were like one ragged hole it didn't resemble even a clover leaf it was just this oblong um you know poke through the paper uh rounds one two three it's a 308 yeah 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 and so it it's a tika they i've never met a tika that doesn't absolutely hammer so it, it shot shot famously um and then it just seems to shoot as famously with four inch or six inches less barrel and that big heavy suppressor on the end of it so Yes, but it, but it balances nicely now too. It does. It's it's pretty. It's kind of outside of uh, the boundaries of what I typically run around with. It's not super heavy. It's eight pounds, twelve and a half ounces. Okay. Uh, as configured, so with the Razor One to Six Gen Two E on there, and uh, all the furniture additions that I've made, uh, and then that Silencer Co. Sandman, or excuse me, uh, Dead Air Sandman tie on the end of it. So, gotcha. Yeah. I know we're not talking about the rifle, but we've been talking about the rifle, so we have to talk about the rifle. Yeah. Uh, not your. Uh, she's a little flashy. Uh, it's got. Uh, it's got a little bit of. Uh, yeah, enhanced livery. Yeah. Yep. She's. Uh, it's visible. A it's visible. <laughs> it's visible. It's a visible rifle. It is. Yeah. We were it, talking about before. I was like, "Oh, does that count as part of like your blaze requirement?" You said you didn't think so. I. I can't see it, counting for my blaze requirement. Um, but I can see it. You know yeah. what I mean? I tell you what. There's another, there another visibility pun. <laughs> you're not gonna, <laughs> you're, uh, you're not going to set it down and lose it. I like that. Correct. Uh, no, so there's there's a couple of uh, versions of this rifle that you can get in Europe. Um, one of them is called the Batu. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing the first orange adorned Tika uh, in an ad I can't remember if it was for Aimpoint or if it was for Tika or if it was for somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they had one of these rifles that was all oranged out mm-hmm. um, with the bolt knob and the grips and the cheek piece and all that stuff and, and the magazine. I said, I have to have that. And then the orange adornment became available in the U.S. And Taylor was so kind as to <laughs> put it all in an email for me. Like, look, you can add all to cart right here. More than happy to spend your money. Yeah. And uh, and so yeah, I had to have it and put it together, and I think it looks pretty sharp. It, I, I really do. It's, I think it, it it's looks cool looking. Wild. It, it's um, you're a little more reserved. I feel well, in general. Are there some things that I don't know about you? You I did mean, used to have a blue mohawk, so maybe this is. Are you kind of? You'll see the gun that I shot sporting clays with the most, and then you. What are you doing? Just rocking out yeah why not i mean sometimes it's, it's okay to have fun this is the first fun gun that i've had in a while yeah it's a serious tool like i'm gonna use it i'm gonna i'm thinking about maybe taking a pronghorn hunting no reason you shouldn't i know that's kind of where i'm at but uh no i, I really wanted that rifle i wanted to kind of as close as i could emulate um kind of a modern european hunting rifle so a lower powered scope, not necessarily a low powered variable on all those rifles over there, but you oftentimes do see lower magnifications on the hole. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one thing that the Europeans do really, really good that I don't understand why the uh, American rifle manufacturers or importers of rifles into America don't is comb heights. Um, so mm-hmm. a, a lot of those rifles over there, even with Antica's line, have an adjustable cheek piece, or you can get these fantastic adjustable uh, cheek piece packs. Um, this company called Calix Technic mm-hmm. that makes this unreal cheek piece, super cool. Um, and so I wanted this. I wanted this uh, lofted comb a little bit, and I wanted and got that and vertical grip presentation, a little bit wider forend. I suppose if I was going to be um, shooting running game or 
wanted to put a precedence on standing shot accuracy and stability, this is a great way to do it. Um, and of course, suppressed. A lot of our friends in Europe run suppressed exclusively, not just Europe, but like New Zealand and sure. uh, Australia and around the, around the world. Um, it's not so much taboo over there as it is over here. Right. Uh, which is just silliness. But uh, yeah, and then an extended magazine. Yeah, the form factor on this thing. It's very just, comfortable. I mean, it screams like, Pick it up and shoot it. Yeah. It's delightful. You know, shoot it well. Yeah, it's delightful to shoot. Like, it's going to fit you. I I really, actually, I have not shot this rifle yet, but it's got a lot of the things that I, like you said, like the comb height looks right. Like It could be a little taller for me. I, You know, I'm I'm picky about that. But uh, Yeah. And I could get a Calyx. Better than a lot. True. I could get a Calyx Technic um, cheek piece to add on to that. They're kind of expensive. They're about 150 bucks, and they add... About four and a half ounces. Not that that's a big deal. The gun's not ultralight in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I could absolutely nail that that cheek piece height requirement for me. But with the uh, the low rings that I have on there and and the scope and this generous eye box, it's it's quite appropriate. I like it. Yeah, it's a cool gun. Taylor, you, so you got a little bit of a different stock on yours. Mm-hmm. What do you got going on there? I outfitted it with a McMillan HTG stock. Um. Edge fill, just keep it light, light as possible. I didn't weigh out to see what the difference was between that and like the standard like factory Tika stock. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine it's much of a sa- weight savings, but it could right. be an ounce or two. But uh, just more or less the profile of the stock, just to fit that that hunting style. Then you both updated your uh, bolt knobs, yes. This just screws into the bottom of the Tika factory bolt knob. Okay. Um, Taylor's is an aftermarket amendment. Yep. Had to fancy it up. Anything, uh, what, what What are the other notables about yours, Taylor? Um, I mean, running just a pick rail instead of uh, tally rings. So I could have shaved, you know, extra four ounces there. But once again, it wasn't going for like a lightweight setup. Mm-hmm. Still something pleasant to shoot in a, in a lighter package. Um, kind of offset some of the suppressor weight just so it balances nicely. But then it's got some mountain tactical aftermarket pieces. So metal bottom metal, uh, metal Tika mag. Oh, interesting, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, like Ryan said about comb height, outfitted a stock pack on there from Pig Tactical just to raise that up. I was looking at some stuff from this Mountain Tactical company online the other day. They make some pretty cool stuff. Hey, no Tikas. Really? Oh, yes. Glock stuff, too. I oh, put yeah. uh, some uh, extended mags on my, my Glock 45 from them, too, and they run pretty well. Yeah, I was looking for... Uh, I don't know if I found it yet. You probably know that it probably exists somewhere. I was looking for like a lightweight, low-profile pick rail. But I didn't find anything that was theirs. Is, theirs is pretty lightweight and low-profile. Tricky part about Picatinny. If you're going to make a Picatinny spec, it's got to be Picatinny spec, and height is one of those things. Some mm. are unusually tall, um, and they don't have to be, but... Uh, they're all light. I mean, the one-piece aluminum rails are all pretty yeah, pretty scant. Yeah, that's true. Uh, shall we get to the task at hand and talk a little bit about velocity? Does it matter? Yeah, as it relates to barrel length. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. does matter. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Right? Um, so I guess if you just pose the question, like, barrel length doesn't matter, we're going to go back and resort to that fantastic statement that we borrowed from uh, Christian, uh, it depends. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's my favorite one. So I, I guess probably more important is like, what are you using the rifle for? If this is a situation in which you want a uh, cartridge like 6.5 Creed, more 6 Creed, more 243, 308, um, even some long action hunting rounds like 280 Ackley, uh, 30 out 6, 270, things like that. Um, and you are putting a precedence on long range with those things, um, you could use a little more help, right? Not that I can't shoot this far, because I'm certain I can. Um, but if you're shooting steel um, or if you're hunting with it and your objective is the most you can get out of that cartridge. Like, like maximizing your long range performance. Yeah, cutting your barrel uh, six inches shorter than it came out of the box, probably not ideal. When I was looking at what my intent with this rifle was, uh, and like very straightforward, it was pretty much hunting whitetail does in Wisconsin during the holiday why, hunt. Why just does? Mark, you know how I am about whitetails. You realize they don't have 
antlers. Has yeah, you one. can't eat the antlers, Mark. Um, no, it's it was for okay. Let me I'll concede to Boardman hunting big game in the Midwest, specifically Wisconsin, because I live here. I wanted a very light, very portable rifle. If I got a 400 yard shot, it's about double the max distance. I'd have figured I would have gotten a shot. I shot a deer out here. Um, and, uh, the other, well, this would have been in December, I suppose it was like 225 yards Mm -hmm. and we would have had to have tried very hard to find more usable distance, um, to take a shot like that. Right. I'd say you can though. Oh, certainly you can. We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Like my, my longest shot here, got him by the way, uh, three thirty. Yeah. But I've, I've been in a couple situations where you probably could have, and I've talked about this many years. It was before I started, you know dialing turrets and getting that whole game and ended up not shooting some deer that would have been just like a like a lay down and shoot it sort of situation sure now the the likelihood is like the places that i'm going to hunt with this rifle are timbered yeah. um i might have some logging roads i might have a few open field agriculture ish areas mm-hmm. um and, and i'm really not going to encounter that much distance Right, so I looked at it. the The ammunition that I wanted to shoot at, uh, it was. I'm not going to say it's an exercise in, in futility, but I looked at okay, what what am I going to expect at 400 yards? And I'm like, that's probably my cap of the cap. And I think, and I mean, you 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 did it, even though I kind of like not corrected, but but you could. I mean, you could, but yeah, sure. four would be, and yeah. you're probably not going to encounter that. No, at least not very often. No, and I'm running a one to six on oh. the, on the gun. Yeah, so like I can do it. Um, it's going to be challenging, and I don't think that that shot opportunity is going to present itself, nor am I necessarily willing to take it. Right. Um, but looking at the intended use of the gun, I'm not shooting long range with this. I'm not trying to maximize my my you know most of the most long range performance out of the cartridge. Um, I was willing to take whatever sacrifices would come from a velocity standpoint in cropping that barrel. I was very surprised at how much velocity I retained even with that barrel chop. Would you like those numbers? I yeah, I'd love to know what it started as, okay, and then where it's at right now. And I the, I love this scope, by the way, one of my absolute favorites. Oh, for hunting optic, unsung hero. This is the Razor One to Six Gen Two E, and this happens to be the JM One BDC reticle, which was developed around three gun esque. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've got those tabulations here as well. I'd be curious to see how well they line up. Yeah. Uh, and like, I love this. I would add more magnification. No, I don't think so. I've taken a number of deer with a one to six. I'm going to do an antelope. I'm almost, I'm almost 90% convinced that that's, I'm taking this pronghorn hunting. I did shoot a deer on six power in Wisconsin one time. Sure. So there you have it. Uh, I didn't have time to turn my scope up. (laughs) You do like that magnification. Uh, so for this test, I did three loads out of there. I did 168 grain, um, federal premium gold medal match Mm -hmm. i shot the factory barnes vortex uh, 150 grain tip triple shock the factory barnes vortex 130 grain tip triple shock and that particular loading the 130 was the one that i was going to focus on the most you know i'm a sucker for that bullet and uh in 308 specifically Mm -hmm. that's a pretty special loading so uh uncut uh 22 inch factory barrel the chronograph for the 168 grain gold medal match uh, three shot average yielded me 2,646 feet per second, which is about in the ballpark. Um, I think the box posted velocities 27 or 2750, I believe. Okay. Um, I, and this was really curious. I had an SD of 19.9, which I don't think is bad. I, I know a lot of folks um, are crazy about got to hit that single digit SD. You might be surprised to take your off shelf box hunting ammunition and run it over to chronograph. And if you find an SD that's like 25 or less, Pretty much in the ballpark for usable ammunition. Yeah. As hand loaders, we can we can I think pretty easily knock that down to single digit numbers. But um, I was I was surprised to see it there. Um, so 168 gold medal match, 2646 with a 199 SD. The 150 grain Barnes TTSX was 2885. Okay. Uh, from the muzzle with a 10.7 SD. Nice. And the 130 green TTSX was 3123 uh, average with a 109 SD. God, that thing's cooking. It is. It was crazy. Is uh, the box posted velocity 
was 31.25. Unbelievable. Yeah. So they were within two feet per second of their average, which was cool. Uh, so then the rifle went off to uh, Matt at Peterson Precision. Uh, gave me a quick turnaround. He turn is around. based out of? Yeah, Argyle, Wisconsin. Yeah. Phenomenal human being. Taylor turned me on to him. I want to, after hearing about your conversation with him yeah. and just how delightful of an experience it was, yeah. I want to chat with him. I th- like a very I th- knowledgeable fellow, it seems. I think he's going to uh, cost me a lot of money. But provide <laughs> me with a lot of happiness. Yeah, he might me too now. Yeah. He's I think a, it's all part of his plan. I think so. That's Customer service goes a long ways, man. I'll tell you what. And he knows his stuff. Yeah. So... So anyway, Matt cut that barrel down, threaded it up for me, um, and then I went and re-chronographed it. Uh, so the 168 grain gold metal match, okay. um, the cut barrel length, so we took six inches off, 2508. Okay, so, hold on. Okay. Give me the, what's the original again? Uncut, 2646. 2646, yep. Cut, 2508. If you, I thought it would have been more than that. Yep. Um, six inches. This was crazy. The SD dropped to a 4.2. Oh, and that was the SD that was like 19 19 before. 4.2. Was that suppressed too? Nope, unsuppressed. You think that was luck of the draw? Uh, I need to shoot more. I'm not going to put a flag in three rounds and say like, whoa, whoa, that's what it does. It was the barrel length. That's what did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have a good theory for that. I have several that I think might be contributing to that, but none of which I know uh, because I've never done this before. Yeah. So I want to revisit that. I want to do some loading. And I'm going to do some loading with some different powders um, and see if I can suss out what I think is the reason for that. Um, 150 grain TTSX. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, again, the uncut velocity was 2885. The cut velocity was 2730. Okay. The 130 TTSX, again, the uncut velocity, 3123. The cut velocity... 2942. Should go back on that 150 TTSX. Uh, the SD is observed 2.6, which previously held a 10.7. Um, the 130 TTSX went from an SD of 10.9 to 14.9. So that one went up. It did. Interestingly enough, I've been shooting the factory 130 TTSXs out of my Kimber since I got my Kimber. And they've always hung under a five foot per second variance. Mm -hmm. And that's, I bet I've run 20 or so boxes of ammunition. I didn't buy them all at once. Yeah. I have one, I have one batch that's a lot. That was 10 boxes. And the others were like two at a time, two at a time, two at a time, different locations. Never even looked at the lot number. They were all under, a, I think my highest was a like a 4.5 or a 5.4 SD wow. out of that gun and that load. So it was, it was interesting to see that kind of um, diminish. Not, you know, but like. I still think it's absolutely acceptable. Not in any sort of meaningful, you know not, what I mean, like. Not for the shooting that I'm going to be doing with it. It's I I won't be able to perceive that difference. I don't think most people would. Yeah, and uh, I shot three three round groups. Um, the biggest was about a point five nine nine at a hundred with that one thirty TTSS. Yeah, that'll do. Because that's my that's the target load that I'm I'm looking to run on it. Uh, what I'm going to do is oh, like that's the not it's not a target load. It's just like it's like the, the one that you would one like I optimally. Yeah. I'd like to use this one. Yep. Um, for all the reasons I've talked about before, I yep. want the f- flattest trajectory I can. I've got that short barrel. I want to. I want to maximize um, impact energy on target, and I love that bullet. So um, twenty nine forty two is nothing to sneeze at. So it's it's still moving a hundred and thirty grain projectile faster than my six five Creedmoor can push a hundred and thirty grain projectile by almost two hundred feet per second. Interesting. Yeah, which is which is pretty neat. Um, so all those numbers are great and wonderful, but what does it like? What does this mean for me downrange? Can I read through this long list of things? Oh, great! Uh, I was trying to do math even with the calculator. I couldn't get it right. Hold on a sec. Um, uh, yeah, read your things, it, and I'm gonna, or you know, maybe you're, maybe you're, maybe you've done the math already. It averages I'm trying out. Trying to do the uh, subtraction, as they call it, to depending on which load you're looking at, between about 25 to 30 feet per second per inch. Okay. So. Where it used to be, I used to uh, read one time that usually you see 65 feet per second per inch. Um, 25 feet per second per inch is, is about 25 to 30 feet per second per inch is what it 
landed on. Yeah, before we were uh, come to chat, you know, I was reading some stuff and it was uh, it varied. It did. That answer varied. Yep. In this case, twenty five to thirty feet per second per mm-hmm. inch. Um, side note, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do some loading with this. I'm gonna I'm gonna speed up the powders a little bit. I saw something online. Um, gentleman had a really good point. It's like, oh, I want to load three oh eight for my sixteen inch gun, but all the load data that I'm looking at is for like twenty four inch guns. Like, where how are my results gonna vary? Were the powder selections used for this barrel length uh, probably more appropriate for a barrel length of that? You know, twenty-four inch class. Oh, because like the the burn rate was yep. optimized for a longer barrel. Yep. Okay. Or or maybe right. So what did he do? He went on the Hodgson Loading Center, the load data center that you go to their website's free. Mm-hmm. Um, he looked up three hundred eight pistol, <laughs> and so he then changed his loads for a three hundred eight pistol with a fifteen inch barrel, and he got better results. Um, consistency, muzzle velocities that were a little bit more surprising because we're changing generally to a faster burning powder, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. I've got some um, I've got some faster ball powder at home. Um, it's a faster burning stuff, and see what those 130s will do. If I can hit that mythical 3,000 foot per second mark, I think I'll be pretty pretty pleased. Oh, that would be uh, that'd I'm be close. Spicy. I'm, I'm within you know 60 feet per second of it, anyways. Boy, anyway. I bet you could do that. And I'm I'm more than happy to to hunt with it as is. But do you think uh, you might be able to push that up to box? No, not safely, or at least I won't. I guess, yeah, uh, no reason to. I guess. Uh, Wait, because do what, do what with it, Taylor? Push it up to like uh, factory muzzle velocity, oh, or at least yeah. what's advertised on the box. No, I don't. I have no reason to do so, uh, because in doing the math, looking at my reticle again, this is a JM1 BDC reticle um, with a 100 yard zero, and my uncut length, my first hash mark comes out at 250 yards. Okay. With nice, my nice with, round number. Yep. With my cut length, two hundred and thirty yards. Okay. So, not insignificant, but not huge. Um, the second hash mark on the uncut version would have been three hundred and eighty yards. Mm-hmm. Three hundred and fifty yards on the cut version. Okay. Uh, and then beyond that, I think I'm I'm pushing beyond what even the I'd be willing to hunt with it at. Right. Yeah. So I go to five ten and six fifty on cut and 475 and 600 cut. Um, but I, I'm pretty much going to hang out to maybe, maybe that second hash mark. And actually probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero at 50. I'm going to push that, that, uh, redundant zero out there a little ways and probably never shoot past my redundant zero distance. I'm likely. Yeah. I don't expect how you intend to shoot that rifle and what it would just work famously for. Yeah you ever hold over. I agree. Um, so wind deflection was then a concern, right? Because I'm already shooting a bullet that has a, a kind of a disparity in ballistic coefficient relative to caliber. Um, so with a 10 mile an hour full value wind, um, uncut at the box, or excuse me, the chronograph velocity, my 300 yard wind hold, again, this is full value, 2.6 MOA. Uh, cut to 16 inches, my 300-yard wind hold is 2.8 MOA. So 0.2 MOA difference. Yeah. Not insignificant, but not huge. No. To, to, I w- will not likely have a shot at that distance, um, and I don't know that I can shoot to that degree of resolution in the first place. So mm-hmm. I would say in general, in this instance, um, context considered, cropping my barrel did not matter. Uh, didn't impact me negatively. For how you intend to use the rifle. Correct. In fact, only positively. Benefited me, yes. right? Because now my rifle is roughly the same length that it left um, the folks in Finland at. Um, I've now affixed a suppressor to the end of the barrel uh, and dressed it up the way I like it, and it is just awesome to shoot. I'm going to have to go down to the... We might have to uh, schedule another range date, Ryan. I'm for it. We'd have another soda. It's giggles abound it's lovely and i don't think i'm uh, i'm gonna well, like i said i'm 91 percent convinced now it's gonna come with pronghorn hunting why not i know yeah i like that mm-hmm. uh you were text when you were shooting it the other day you were texting me mm-hmm. i was at home you were at the range mm-hmm. i like it i'm tickled pink i do it is mm-hmm. i mean it's all the things it's yeah. all the things that i like about 
when I look at a rifle, I'm like, I want it to be those things. Sure. Except a generally a higher magnification scope. What What's cool now too is okay. So we we talked um, with the fellas. Not too over, high. Okay. We talked with the fellas at Hornady about terminal ballistics. You know, and um, they a bombshell they drop seven PRC. Uh, look at the barrel lengths that they're using for the load data. And I think I think Seth was running 20 inches and shorter for some hunting rifles on seven PRCs. And we've got a, a phenomenal cartridge design uh, that does very well in a shorter profile. Um, look at the 375 Ruger, where you're usually having a 24-inch or longer barrel um, on a 375 H&H. Mm-hmm. 375 Ruger does it in a 20 300 short mag. This is one that you're enamored with. I'm enamored with. Taylor's enamored with. You can get by yeah. with. You can buy with shorter barrels on there, and mm-hmm. it, with which powder, is one of the reasons. That's one of the things I like about it. Yeah, and with with uh, powder technology the way it is nowadays, Ugh. and with bullet technology the way it is nowadays, shooters not giving up a thing. Um, I still don't think like you know if you if you're looking to build yourself the ultimate extra long range gun. You're probably going to sure. have a little bit of barrel there. Sure. But for the hunter, um, I don't think you're giving up a heck of a lot. I think what you're gaining in just like functionality, practicality, uh, enjoyment in just carrying yeah. a package, like more like this, I'll sacrifice a little speed. And oh, yeah. then and and then also, and I guess I'm saying that, like even going back to like uh, 300 short, like I don't know if I'd go to a 16 no i think that's diminishing returns but i'd go to a 22 sure yeah absolutely what about a 20 why not would you go with a 20 or a 22 depends you can run one of these things on the end of there <laughs> there's some wonderful suppressors out there right now um, and i'm very new to suppressors too i don't know anything about them and all of a sudden it's just like i started researching i started looking at like what makes a really effective can from like a suppression standpoint? Mm-hmm. What makes a really effective can from like a durability standpoint? Where does an ultralight can land in there? Um, I'm going can crazy right now. I, I was just gonna say that. Just tax stamps everywhere. It's things, I'm, have, things have gotten a little bit. <laughs> I'm going bonkers. I'm I really am. And so I'm I'm pursuant of a couple of suppressors right now that are very short form factor, mm-hmm. very lightweight. They're not. They're not winning awards from suppression. Right. Like, it's not the Hollywood quiet. And none of them are. If you've never heard a suppressor go off, like we shoot, Taylor and I, on the consumer sales team, we go do range certifications weekly. uh, And you have to wear Ear Pro in there if you're shooting suppressed. Uh, If you don't, you're going to knock your teeth out. And it's not great. Um, It's still loud. Like 130 plus decibels loud. But it's a heck of a lot better than unsuppressed. Correct. And um, so I'm learning a lot about suppressors now, and I'm finding that there are, uh, I think, changes within the suppressor manufacturer com- or manufacturers that are making smaller, lighter, stronger cans mm-hmm. that aren't yielding suppressive or suppression values much. Um, so now you can get a six or a seven inch suppressor um, that weighs, you know, between eight and ten ounces. Um, That'll be absolutely awesome for hunting. You're not toting a bunch of weight. You're not adding a ton of length to the end of your your barrel. So, in your in your scenario there, 22 inch on a 300 short, you know, instead of 24 or 26 or whatever, um, you hang a, a small lightweight suppressor on the end of it. It's not the end of the world. No. But then again, here I, I ask, I ask you, you, I ask listeners, I ask myself, how far are you going to shoot that gun? And what do you really need to have an effective ballistic solution or a terminal package at those distances? Um, I think if you can, if you can emulate the ballistics that you're looking for within a reasonable margin and you're still putting payload on target, um, what's wrong with a 20 inch gun? Right. Yeah. So you lose 60 feet per second compared to that 22 big deal make a bullet change maybe you drop down and wait but you change the bullet type to like a really tough you know bonded bullet or a copper bullet um and now you you get all that punch back or maybe you go to well you know what i'm saying right yeah so like we can get into a cycle in which we're constantly saying wow we could just get a little bit better and you're gonna end up with like a 30 inch gun shooting like a 300 rum um 
and it's going to just be horrible. And you're going backwards, right? right? So you're going to have to, I guess, merge or marry your expectations um, with the with reality, like you as a shooter. Um, and somewhere in there, you're going to find a super portable package. And I don't think there's anything wrong with a 20 inch, 300 short mag. Um, there's a lot of a lot of shooters out there that are doing that. There's data out there, um, hand load factory, chronograph tests, et cetera, that'll kind of point you in that direction. And if you hand load, then you might be able to squeak a little bit more out of it. And right. you might be right back to where you started uncut. Um, my 6.5 proof gun that you like to shoot, that's a 20 inch gun. Um, I'm not giving up a heck of a lot. I mean, at all. No. So you and I were shooting at 600 the other day and ting, ting, ting. Yeah. All day long. So, I mean, it was shooting just famously. And for what we were getting it ready for, it was delivering what it needed to do to, you know, kill something at 600 yards, which is. It's on the fringe, man. Yeah. Yep. You know, I mean, that's a long shot. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. I've killed stuff further than that. A lot of people have killed stuff a lot further than that. But I'd say, in general, that's kind of. I've found that mark to be my max for a lot of hunting conditions, you know, um, and really the max that you even encounter. Yeah, I really don't run into stuff that far out. Or huh. if I do, I just laugh at myself and think, like, I'm just, you're not that guy. <laughs> just sneak a little closer. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, you get something across a valley, like, that's, that's not really sneaking closer. That's all the way down. All, oh, wait, now I'm on the other side. Now I can't see it because I'm on the other side. The it's num- like you're, you're either going to shoot him at 600 or 6. So the number of times that that's happened to me, pursuant of mostly pronghorn and mule deer, which are those characteristic got to have a far gun species, or at least that's what I was told when I was a right. youth. That's why I built a 300 Weatherby for my, my first Western gun. Um, killed a pronghorn at like 87 yards with it, by the way. So yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, yeah, when, <laughs> when we went on the Alaska hunt, we had dope to forever and then, you know, shot a deer at 60 yards. Yeah, right. Um, pursuant to those two species, probably more than anything else, the number of opportunities that I've had where I've looked at it, like I would say as an ethical and educated shooter and be like, I can take that shot is less than five. Yeah. Truly. At one point, weren't you going to build a 338? I was. For a big old mule deer? Yeah, I saw a mule deer one time at, at this ungodly distance, and he was colossal. I mean, he's in the, the probably top five of mule deer I've ever seen alive. And I was like, well, I guess I need a 338 now. And uh, there's no way I could have taken that shot. Even now, like all the shooting that I do, not a prayer. Was this like many years ago? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're like, I need bigger. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And pff, it's just, just go to the store with, you know, like, what do you got that's bigger than yep. this? It, it was, that's totally silliness, um, at least for me. And the number of times that I've encountered shots that that are are beyond that five or 600 yard range that are doable is so infrequent. I mean, doable in the sense that I could lay down and pull the trigger, but like my confidence would be below 50% on, on impact. It's just not happening. I'm not doing it. Not me. Um and it's just been so... Yeah, I mean, you got to be, like, if you're, you know, you want to be obviously very confident yeah. in that shot. Like, it, it's so infrequent that that comes up for me. I mean, the, it's just, it is. I, I had an opportunity at the pronghorn I shot last year at, like, probably between 60 and 80 yards. And by the time I got done goofing around, he was just a little over three. Um, How much goofing around were you doing? I had to get my pack off and get my gun out and get my <laughs> get my shooting sticks unfolded or something and like opened up and it was a whole thing. Um, but like you were almost at the yeah. end of the chapter. Yep, you needed to finish. You know. Yep. And so I was a lot of goofing around and then yeah, I mean when he stopped walking and looked back, that's where he was and it, it was fine. We had, we had a good shot angle. We had good wind and. Um, you know, a couple hours later, my hunting partner uh, and I stocked up on another group and 299 yards and we had a spectacular rest and he had a perfect broadside shot and put one down too. And it's just, it just doesn't happen that often. And so like a gun like this, I could, I could take out there. I'd have like an iota of hesitation just because it is a 16 inch 308. But then I look back at the number of pronghorn and mule deer that I've killed in the past, you know, decade and a half 
like, oh yeah, it's all falling within the realm of what I intended its use for anyway. So what difference does it make? Well, right. And uh, number, you didn't really lose a whole heck of a lot. Not really. Uh, 150 to 180 feet per second from the box post or from the chronograph results. Right. And then, you know, you look at, you know, I guess particularly that 130 Barnes Mm -hmm. that with the cut barrel, you're pushing at 2942, which if you're going to put like a comparable bullet in a 6.5 Creed, you're still eclipsing that. And that would be something that I wouldn't even hesitate. Like that'd be a gun that, that I would reach for. Yeah. Now, I guess you're going to have a little bit better BC in the 6 Creed, De- or 6.5 Creed. Definitely. Yeah, right? so that's going to come into play yep. as far as when you start, you know. But even then, m- like. Making a ballistics chart. Running those two side by side, the 6.5 is starting to um, eclipse the 308, like meaningfully, at distances where I'm approaching the max threshold that I'm going to play it anyhow. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. And that's why I'm so comfortable hunting with 308. It's, it just does everything I need it to do. Um, and I still shoot a lot of six five. I've killed more stuff with a six five in the past three years than I have with a three oh eight. So but it's it's interesting how little difference there is between these two cartridges specifically and then in this case, chopping that barrel off. What am I really losing? And it's it's not much. Taylor, what have you seen with yours? Did you did you work with it uh and it's uh Full length version before you cut it down. Or? I didn't. I jumped into it right away. You just and cut her down. Just cut it right off. So you had it like a day, didn't you? Two days, and then not Matt. even. I contacted Matt like right away. Like, hey, I got a project for you. What can we do? <laughs> <laughs> so took it over to him, yeah. chopped it. But then you had me chrono that one thirty Barnes to yeah. get an idea before you cut yours down. And I think it was twenty nine thirty two out of mine. Yep. Okay. And uh, SDs were sub ten. I want to say it was like point eight or eight point something, nine point something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that was with which bullet again? The the Barnes Factory um, TTSX, the one thirty grain. Okay, pretty similar. Yeah, they're cool, man. I don't know. I mean, the, I keep going back to the same thing, but I, I just think what you gain, and you, you know, you can take it. You don't have to take it. At, you don't have to take six inches. You know, no. but um, it sure makes it. You know, like if you want to add a add a suppressor, like it makes it. Like, it's just, like, part of the original rifle. I don't know. Like yeah. that, like I said, that's something that has prevented me from putting the suppressor on the past just because it's, like, this thing that hangs way out there. Uh, part of it is the aesthetic at that point, too, right? It looks like just, like, you got this, you know, 12-foot-long barrel, you know? Um, it's funny how it looks without the can on it. It's just cute oh, little, yeah. Let's see cute the, little Red Rider. Let's see the contrast there. Oh, dear. It's just kind of hilarious. Oh, goodness. There we go. It looks right and wrong at the same time. <laughs> at the same time. But like functionality-wise in a tree stand, like oh, even yeah. just carrying it up yep. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Wow. That is something. Yeah. Uh, if I do end up getting, um, you know, a more compact and, and lighter suppressor, uh, very likely that it'll. You just can't shoulder a rifle with a not headset with the headset on. on. No, no. You, Mark, you can take it off. We'll fill the void of silence. Did you end up weighing your whole rifle? You know, it's funny. I just got. I just got shake out too. I just got done talking about how uh, you know. Oh, you got a you know standard length rifle, and you put a suppressor on. It looks so long. And then you took the suppressor off of this one. I'm like, it looks so short. I know it. Um, so the rifle, uncut as configured, weighed eight pounds, two ounces. With the suppressor on it, it's eight pounds, 12 and a half ounces. So I, the suppressor's a heavy suppressor for what it is, right? So it's um, 16.8 ounces or 16.9 ounces. And the um, barrel length reduction ended up averaging about an ounce and a half per inch. So, which I guesstimated pretty close to. And so I, I like netted, you know, a, a 10 and a half ounce addition. In weight, so it was, it's pretty cool. So it's eight pounds, twelve and a half ounces, uncut, or, or cut, excuse me, and suppressed as configured. So I'm well, I'm quite pleased. That's cool, you know. I, I, like looking at it, well, with the suppressor on yeah. or or off. I mean, I could see where there could be, you know, specific hunts where you sure. take the suppressor off. Um, I was just imagining it, you know, strapped to the side of your pack. It's just going to tuck right into the side of your pack. You know, you're. Uh, Maybe you have it strapped to your pack because you're 
covering some miles, you know, through, you know, maybe just thick, nasty stuff, you know, where it's just maybe it's like thick bush where you're like, I'm, I need to get through this. Yeah. I'm not planning on getting a shot while I'm getting through this stuff. Man, that would just suck right in. It's not going to hang up on anything. And then also still hunting in, you know, maybe thick, dark timber or, you know, maybe you're in the PN dub or whatever. Um, good old Wisconsin deer drive. Yeah. I mean, a good old Wisconsin deer drive, it's just going to, you know, you can manipulate it through sure. thick there, cover really well. There's some awesome suppressor designs out there where – you mentioned putting it on your pack. Like if you do have a precedence for compactness for getting into stuff, right? So you've hunted a lot of crazy thick, wild stuff, whether it's in the PNW or in Alaska. I know you've told me before about going through alders and um, what's that crazy thorny stuff? Oh, Devil's Club. Yeah, and and you're going through that crap, and like the last thing you want is something hanging above you and like catching you on mm-hmm. stuff or redirecting stuff into your face. Well, and then and which I love to carry my rifle strapped to the side of yep. my pack but it does elev- you know yeah. what i mean you do stick up yep. and, and i have caught it on things before you're like oh, i can clear that you're like tink and then you're like Ugh. You so know. nothing says that i have to walk around with my suppressor on that gun right so it's no. not it's not massively convenient to one put a thread protector on there and then take the thread protector off put the can on there there's a suppressor designs um like i believe yours is amendable right you could change the the caps on yours yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you, you Taylor could go to like a bayoneting style attachment on his, mm-hmm. where you'd have a muzzle device of some kind that you just slip over, and then you got like a quarter turn or or a single turn lock and engage. So it's it's suppressor on click. You're gonna have to manage your point of impact shift, uh, which is likely to happen um, it, unless you were running like a fabulously rigid barrel with a extraordinarily lightweight suppressor on it. Um, but I think we both observed POI shift. Yeah, that was notable. Mm-hmm. Right, that was notable. I yeah. was gonna, I was gonna ask if the shorter system mitigates it at all. Uh, I, I imagine yes. Right. So if we or, take a barrel that is uh, long and we cut it, we've made it more rigid. Right. Yep. So suffice to say, and I didn't test this. Had I had it threaded five ace twenty four, um, at twenty two inches, and tested my POI shift with can addition. I believe it probably would have been more than if I would have uh, had it at 16 inches. It, and I honestly, I didn't put it to the test to really say like, okay, it is this much. On my 280 Ackley, which actually has a fairly stout steel barrel, um, it's fluted, uh, it's it's pretty robust. I get two MOA down, two MOA right with that suppressor mm-hmm. very consistently. So it is something where I'd take it off, and I, I've tested enough where I'm very confident in it. Like if my can is off and I put my can back on, I'm back to the zero that I established with the suppressor. Um, and, you know, I think some of those bayonetting attachments, you know, are very famous for being extraordinarily repeatable uh, as well. So, you know, that's something where if, if portability is a, a concern or a, an attribute that you're pursuant of, having the ability to add a suppressor quickly um, so you can take it from that mega short form factor to not a super long form factor, but now a suppressed form factor. Mm-hmm. Easy enough to do. I doubt that that thing ever leaves that gun. It's just, yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's just not it's not grotesquely long no. the way it is right now. Like I can't really see. I don't see it affording you like a big advantage to be like on and off. With I don't it. think so. I don't think so. But it is cute with it off, though. It is. Maybe if I get a little can. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about, um, you know, shortening your barrel, decreasing velocity. But also, uh, I'd say more than necessary barrel length Yeah. could decrease your velocity as well. Sure. With a little thing called friction. Yeah. Now I don't think most guns. Cu- I think most guns are optimized, so that's not going to happen. Yeah, you're going right? to you're going to have to get into some extraordinary lengths. Right, but I guess my only point is, you know, don't think in contrast that oh, if I had a 34 inch barrel, this is going to be really fast. Turn my 308 into a 300 yeah. rum. No, which I don't think most people are thinking. No, no. I think that's happening because the cartridge, or if that were to happen theoretically, like the cartridge would have. Expended all its gases, it's pushed the barrel to its or the bolt to its max velocity in the barrel, and then it's 
now the friction going down the barrel is imparting, I guess, more a, a negative. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that, was it the folks at MDT did that? I was just amazing that test. Oh really? What was that? I'm not aware like? of it. So they they, they, they oh, this is ah this is cool. It was almost cartoonish how long it was. Yeah. So they made a two piece barrel, and I can't remember what their starting test length was, but it was greater than forty inches. It was comical. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was comical. It reminds me of those. Uh, what were those uh, shotguns that had just like the crazy The Metro one? tubes. Yes. There's a thing I regret not buying is a Metro tube. I used to see ads for those like in the back outdoor life. One, of the, cool, white ad. one of the coolest things ever. I read You it. can't get a Metro tube anymore? You can, but you're probably going to pay for it. Oh, goodness. Um, I remember uh, a write-up on them where the guy's like, it sounds like a car door shutting. And I'm like, certainly it can't be like that. Then I heard it in real life. And it sounds like you like slam your truck door. Unbelievable. Yeah. Super cool. And I had a barrel of them at the gun shop that I worked at. And it's just like, ah, I should A barrel buy of barrels. Yeah. I should, I should really get one of these damn things. Yeah. Never did it. There, like, the novelty was just like, what the heck am I, you know. Wh- Super how would valid. I- Super valid. Yeah. Super cool. But anyway, so... They have this two-piece barrel, super long, and they cut it down inch by inch by inch by inch by inch, and I think to 16 yeah. inches is where they stopped. Well, actually, no. I think they cut it down below that because they? they're up in Canada. Oh, no, okay. No restriction. Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. surprising to me, What actually. was the deal that we found out we can't hunt Canada with these guns now? Oh, um, I was looking into it because my brother-in-law, he goes up there yeah. every other year or something for, in Alberta for Whitetail. And the barrel length, I forget what it was in centimeters. Uh, I did the conversion. It was like 18 and a half or something like that. Okay. Can so we? Uh, do you think we could put muzzle devices on them and be good? I don't know. I mean, pin and well. So but. that's more of like a hunting regulation provision? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not but a, it was you, like, can, you can have it. You can't you just yeah, it was like hunt with it. Barrel length. Well, I don't think you can have it. It's like minimum 18 and a half or 18 have it. inches. I, I don't know. I, yeah. Taylor, Taylor made me aware and of this. I don't, I don't remember exactly because I was getting all jazzed up. I'm like, I'm taking this up there and not anymore. So the We'll just have to get another Tika. Yeah. Shoot. No, um, no, the, the wisdom will come with. The wisdom ooh. will come with. Yeah. But they, they, cut, they, they cut these barrels down. They mapped the velocity. They did an unbelievably wonderful presentation of data. Um, and you, you can see it go from like, yes, it's higher, but not amazingly high. And then there's like a node that occurs where it's like that is the sweet spot for maximizing velocity um, and barrel length. And then it begins to diminish and drop, and you see it go in steps. And you check it out. It's an awesome test. Super. I will check that out. Awesome test. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, they did They did a bang-up job on that. Yeah. Um, different different thing, though. Yeah, yeah. Different, yeah, different thing. It was with a 22, right? No, it was a 308. Oh, it was a 308. Yeah. Oh, never mind. Yeah. It's cool. CZ had a 22 um, for a while that uh, had an extra long barrel on it, and uh, that friction thing was starting to impart force on that projectile, and it would, it would, it would slow most things down to a very, very, very quiet level. It's a cool gun, yeah. And the CZ, I think it was a 452 trainer. Uh, they had a long, long barrel on it, like 27 inch barrel. It was like the Metro tube yeah. of 22s. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they had that for a long time. Gosh, now I want a Metro too. Man, did I goof up. Yeah, we can probably find one. Um, golly, very practical, guys. Yeah. I mean, like you said, a stalking rifle, tree stand rifle, you know, yep. hunting hunting deer in the Midwest, you know, bears over bait. I mean. I never even considered the bear thing. That's a brilliant idea. Sure, why not? It'd be yep. perfect for that. Yeah, I agree. Yep. I, I kind of, the second I, Put, zipped up the case after the range night. Oh boy, I need to build another one of these. Do I do it in 338 Federal? Do I do it in 86 Blackout? 338 Federal. That's not one you hear about very well, often. That's kind of a lead balloon, Mark. Wink, wink. It nudge, is. nudge. <laughs> <laughs> you want, I know you want to do another lead balloon. Real um, bad. Um, 10 likes. We'll do another lead balloon. There. You know what? 10 likes. We'll do another lead balloon. There. Oh, thank heavens. Um, yeah, but no, th- not 10 likes. 10. Uh, 10 comments saying, do the lead balloon. Please, lead balloon, 10 times. Um, I'll get my burner accounts going for you. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've heard about those, <laughs> by the way. Uh, yeah, maybe a different cartridge. Maybe something um, I put like a heavier precedence on suppression or, um, you know, 
mass on target, something like that. 338 Federal is a pretty appealing one. Yeah. Um, the only kind of bugaboo about that is then I'm, I'm getting into a pretty specific suppressor. Um, and actually, a lot of these companies are, are making cans that are large caliber compatible, but not not like specific. Like you can get a um, you know a thirty six caliber can or a forty five caliber can that would be at as at home on your hunting rifle as it would your pistol or a lever gun or something like that. So maybe that's not such a major imposition, but something interesting to think about anyhow. For sure. Yeah, three thirty eight Federal, eight six Blackout, three seventy five Raptor. What about three seventy five Ruger? That's a big gun. It'd yeah. be great. It'd be a great idea. No question about it. But that's a lot of gun. It's bigger. It is. Yeah. Bigger's better. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. We've been talking about that a lot lately. Yeah. <sighs> Taylor, any final thoughts? That's all I got. Appreciate you having me. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. I I was gonna mention, then I just got so damn excited. Uh, is this? Is this your first time? Or we've had you on the podcast before. First time. First time. Yeah, I should have acknowledged that. Taylor Myers. I am now. Gentlemen. Taylor Myers. Taylor I'm Myers. Just, I'm just happy to be here. Along for the ride. That's my motto. Yeah. With a lot of things. You learn a lot. Yeah. A uh, con- couple of fun facts about Taylor. Yeah, please. Um, some of the greatest penmanship. <laughs> when he writes, When he writes you a note, man, that's nice. Like, it could just be, like, something totally just like, hey, this guy called, but you're like, oh, I should keep that note. That's really nice. It's it's awesome. I'm going to have to check this out. Yeah, it's pretty cursive? good. Cursive? Oh, he, he can write cursive. I can. I Excellent will. cursive. I prefer it. Yeah. yeah. They quit teaching it. I know. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. yeah. It's lost art. He's an excellent taste in pickup trucks. Um, excellent taste in rifles. Um, Jim's not here to deprecate the both of us for the choices that we make. In vehicles. Oh. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's right. You're looking at uh, two really good brothers here. Two, uh, you like the... Uh, I do miss my full-size Tundra. Toyota Tacoma. I can give you a ride in mine and bring back all the good memories. I, I sent you a, I sent you an Instagram. Oh, the slander that you sent me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, yeah. I, then I redacted my statement because there was a different Toyota Tacoma Instagram real probably or something like yep. that and i was like well maybe i need one of these things i think so um talk to paul kendall he'll he'll convince you i know he had a tundra and he went back to the uh taco the tacoma mm-hmm. yeah which i hey i don't just like i think you know if you're going on uh like even like logging roads man they can get pretty skinny pretty tight tough spots to turn around i mean yeah if you're gonna do anything outside of the mall parking lot well, that's where I spend most of my time in my it. vehicle. I know. That's why you Ryan, got those so. golf cart tires on your... I don't know. When we took my Tundra out to um, Montana, we we're out near Thompson Falls, bear hunting. I mean, there's some pretty sketchy service roads, but Tundra was just fine. How'd that go? It was a little sketchy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like look over, it'd be like 600 yards, just drops off. Jim's not here, but he would be... Uh, he'd probably be delighted. Oh, that vein in his neck and his head when he gets talking about Tacomas? He just... He's got a disdain for him. But I was going to say, he would be delighted with what I'm about to say. So, I've said it before. I say it uh, un, uh, unabashedly or unashamed. Uh, yeah, anyway, we've got a minivan. It is like the most practical, fit anything you want in it. You know, it doesn't do great in the snow. It's not an awesome off-road vehicle, right? Like, it doesn't have those attributes. But for general use, like, I find it actually more useful than my damn truck. That said... I was talking to a good buddy of mine, Joey Pyburn, one of the hosts of Outdoor Line Radio, about Subaru Outbacks the other day. Mm. And he's got a Subaru Outback. Mm-hmm. And he's used it a lot in lieu of his pickup. He says it suits his needs. Uh, you know, It's kind of like uh, this rifle. Yeah, you're trading some things, but you are trading them for positive things. So. Oh, yeah. There's... there's, there's- a lot of in the good bucket. Yeah. You know, I mean, good, you know, we've talked about this before when we've talked about the Forester that Jim bought off eBay and <laughs> fixed up. Good ground clearance, all wheel drive. Um, Joey's has some sort of, what is it, ATX mode or something like that? Like it's like, like kind of like a crawl mode where you just kind of like hands off the pedals and it'll like crawl down like gnarly stuff. Uh, 
handles like a race car. I mean, those guys specialize in rally cars. He's like, oh, yeah. And then, you know, you pull over. He's like, you know, if, if it's, I th- I'd imagine if it's just you. He's like, yeah, I can just crawl in the back and sleep in the damn thing. And I'm like, there's a lot of pluses. So I'm going to keep the Tundra, but I'm trying. When my wife transits, she doesn't want to drive a minivan forever, Yeah, which I get. And I'm trying to talk her into the Subi. The Sub. Yeah. I might need some help from Jim on that. It's a great idea. Great cars. So, um, get the podcast sponsored by Subaru. There we go. We should have the last time we talked about him so darn much. Um, and a truck company because you need both. Um, cool guys. Well, thank you. Thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for getting these cool rifles, putting them together. Thanks for coming here and chatting about them. I think we've talked a lot about a lot of um things that have merit. Yeah. You know, kind of like broader merit. Like you don't have to necessarily go sixteen, but Maybe you don't have to go 24 either. Sure. So. Sure. I think it just depends, just like optic selection. You know, what what is the task at hand? Yeah. That's the most important thing. What are yeah. you using it for? You Where are, are you at? Correct. What are you doing? How are you doing it? So. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, yeah, let us know. Let us know what you thought. Let us know your thoughts on barrel length. Did we dispel maybe any myths or misconceptions, perhaps, or maybe spark an idea? Are you going to build a modern-day scout rifle like these modern gentlemen? Let us know. We want to hear all about it. We like guns and stuff and talking about guns and stuff, and then we just do it, and then we do it more. It's yes. great. So, all right. Catch you on the next one. See Bye. ya. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.